circumstance yeah what did you walk in here with tonight we declare that he's good over all of those things
We bow before you. There's no one like our God. Yeah. Sing it holy, holy to my one and only. Who is like our God? Yeah. And our hearts adore you as we bow before you. There's no Just rest in that reminder today. Reminders of what He's done in our lives. Reminders of the times that we've seen Him do things that have been unreal. When we didn't think He was going to come through, we were, we're always so busy with Him, and then He still shows up and He shows us that He always is who He says He is. And when we gather here, what we're trying to do is just cut through all the clutter. see that in him and 
say, God, all we can do is lavish upon you. Praise. We thank you for who you are. Worship you because of who you are. So just for one more song, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to say, God, who is who he says he is. Um, and we praise him for that because it's all that we can ever do. All, all that we can do as we look upon who he is. Is say, God, we want to give back. You've given us so graciously. We want to give back. Sing this out as we are. God is our creator. God is on the throne. God is our consumer. Head of all of men. God is our good father. God is endless love. God is ever present. Singing and Jesus is our answer. Jesus is our key. Jesus is the doorway to heaven's everything. Jesus is our brother, Jesus intercedes, Jesus brings the captive, feeds the captive free, the exalted one, he is overcome, this is who our God is, see the Lord most high, he is glorified. This is who our God is. The Spirit is our comfort. The Spirit is the thing. The Spirit is the water. The fire and the wind. The Spirit is our answer. The Spirit speaks the truth.
Yeah, Lord, we do. We give you honor and praise. We say all glory and honor, dominion and power belong to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever and ever and ever. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Man, this is like a throne room moment, friends, right? When we get to tell Jesus who he is and worship him on his throne. Um, and the, the psalmist says, Father to the fatherless and a defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. That's so intrinsic to the character and the nature of our God is that he is the father to the fatherless and a defender of widows in his holy habitation. That God's display of glory is God's display of his father heart. And even as I was coming up, I, I believe tonight that there are some of us in the room who feel uh, forgotten, who feel left behind. Um, you walked in and maybe you're watching your friends um, or your community or your family or all the myriad of people on Instagram taking steps or getting advancements that you think you should have. Um, or maybe you're here and you just feel left behind by God. You're like, Lord, I've been walking with you for a long time, and I didn't expect to be here right now um, in this moment. Um, and I believe that the Lord's word for you tonight is that he is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows in his holy habitation. I have the words of Ezekiel 37 ringing in my ears, right, that um, we serve a God who, who raises dead things back to life. The metaphor and the picture is that there are these, this field of dry bones, right? They've been there long enough to just be dry, decomposed in the sun, like long forgotten. And then the Lord brings the prophet there and he says, speak to the bones and, and speak that flesh would come back on them. And then speak and prophesy that breath would come and fill them back up again. And it's this picture of God. Um, the things that we believed were gone and forgotten um, and abandoned that God comes and breathes new life into. So if you're here tonight and you're feeling like you are forgotten and there are some graveyards in your soul of things that you have left behind or given up on, I really believe that the Lord wants to breathe new life into those things. And not just by giving us like what we want. It's, that's not what this is about. But this is about the personal presence of Jesus coming in to the places of our heart and our lives where we feel and experience the most tension. And so what I want us to do tonight is even just let our souls get quiet for a sec. And I just want us to ask Jesus a question and see what he says. We're all about Jesus. You say, Jesus, where are you in this thing? You fill in the blank for you. What are you doing right now in this? Where are you in this? And then just listen and see if he says something. Father to the fatherless, and a defender of widows, and a friend to the one on the outside, the champion of the hurting is our God in his holy habitation, that the perfect display of God's power is the perfect display of his love for you and for us. So Jesus, we love you. We receive your love for us. I do. I ask that you would show us where you are. Show us the places that you are resurrecting, that you're bringing life back into. And Lord, wherever we are in that journey, whether all we see are bones or whether we see an army that doesn't have breath yet, um, I pray that you would um, breathe hope. And you would show us that you love us and you would be present with us in the midst of our disappointments and our suffering. So we love you, Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. We say, let earth rejoice. He reigns forevermore. God is on the throne, high and exalted. We bless you in the name of Jesus, for the glory of God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of young adults said, amen and amen.
And amen. Hey, such a joy. Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand clap. We love you, Jesus. So good, friends. Hey, as we transition out of worship here, um, I want to give us a couple of announcements, even let us know of a handful of things that are coming up in the, uh, the life and the future of our ministry. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Josh. I'm the Young Adults Pastor here. A um, couple of really exciting announcements. Hey, how many of you guys were on the Peru trip last year? Let's go. Hey, we are a community here that believes deeply in missions and the missional heart of God for the nations. Um, we are going to Peru again in 2024. Yes. So um, that trip is June 1st through 11th. If you want to know more about that or get signed up, I think we should have some drop cards around here somewhere. Victoria, do we have drop cards? We do. Thank you, Victoria. She's amazing. We have drop cards back on that table. Uh, we would love for you to join us as we minister to the people of Peru. I have a list so I don't forget what else is next. Um, hey, this Friday and this Sunday, um, we are doing one of the, the most joyful things that the people of God can do. Um, and we're having a baptism service at Friday night and then our Sunday uh, North Congregation. This is a time we're going to celebrate literally hundreds of people coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Praise God. So if you're in this room and you have not been baptized and you have made the decision to say, I'm following after Jesus, come talk to me about it. Come talk to Pastor Eddie. Talk to Victoria. We would love to talk to you more about that. Baptism is a really important part of our journey uh, as we follow Jesus. So that's happening this um, Friday and then that's next Sunday as well. Um, one last fun invitation is, uh, is Jordan, Jordan Hale in the house. Let's go, Jordan. Hey, Jordan last week won our pumpkin painting competition. Give a round of applause for Jordan. Hey, Jordan, can you run to the front real quick? I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, we have a prize because he won. All right, Jordan, here's the deal. There's two shirts here. One of those is for you, and one of those is for you to give to someone you've never met. Okay? Can you do that? Yeah, go do it. Go do it, Jordan. If you haven't met Jordan, raise your hand, and he'll give you a t-shirt maybe. <laughs> okay. With that, friends, it's good to be with you guys. Um, greet someone around you. Tell them you love them. Pastor Eddie's coming up in a sec, and we'll go from there. Ready, break. Find yourself a nice padded seat. Settling little by little. Um, I was not here last week because we were in the midst of recording an album on Tuesday night. We were already working on it. So uh, thanks for all of you who came last Wednesday. It was a great night. Worshiping the Lord and... Uh, and because you came tonight, you get a free copy of, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> everyone's like, what? <laughs> no, but we will uh, hopefully be releasing that album in uh, probably the spring. Uh, it takes a while to finish projects. But anyway, it was such an amazing time. But even though I wasn't here on Tuesday night, I did watch online. And um, Pastor Josh preached an amazing message. If you weren't, weren't here, you need to go back and listen to that because... 
he talked about um, the judgment of God, but he did it in such a way that I think really reflects God's heart, um, not just showing you the facts about things, but showing you um, just some really important pieces about God's judgment. And um, honestly, it's, it's pretty hard to find sermons like that one um, out there. So I just, I can't recommend it enough to you. If you weren't here, please go back and watch that. Um, tonight, we're, we're in a similar space um, and tone in the book of Jude. We're going to go through a few more verses. There's lots of strong language, um, some weird wording, I would say, that we're going to tackle. But um, here, here's the great thing. All of God's word is profitable. Um, it's, it's useful. It's, it's good for you to learn. And uh, you don't want to be the kind of Christian who only like finds the highlights of whatever they think they need to learn. You want to be the kind of Christian who can dive into any of the passages and just say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do here today? What, what, of, what in this passage could profit um, me here tonight? And I believe that that's, there's something here for you. And um, I think there's something here for all of us, something that we can learn and uh, speaking of learning, uh, the past few months, one of my favorite things that's been happening is that my oldest daughter, Daniela, she's been learning piano, but just like on her own. Um, so without any, any lessons, she just started sitting down at the piano in our house and just like plucking out, bas- uh, yeah, just like figuring out the melody of Silent Night, which I don't know where she got that from, if that was anything specific, because oddly enough, that is the first song I learned on the piano. Um, like just sitting down also. And so I don't know if I ever told her that, and that's why she started doing that. But it's just so, it's, it's so special to me to see that. And she starts sitting down there, and she's going to be like, bum, 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 bum. And again, she doesn't know how to read music yet. I haven't taught her any of that. So she's just learning all this by ear. And then I would be like working in the kitchen, and I'd be like, no, not that note. It's, it's a few higher. And, you know, just kind of like help her piece it together. Then I sat down with her, and I was like, here's what a chord is, and I was teaching her the left hand, and I was like, this is the C chord, G chord, F, and I was like, now put the melody with it, and she just started, like, putting it together, um, and, and so then she just, I mean, she would do this for, like, an hour a day. She just loved it, like, would play piano, play piano, play piano, and a couple weeks ago, I sat down with her. I was like, okay, I feel like she's, she's got a lot of the notes, but then I just want to sit down with her, and she played it, and then I noticed that she had learned piano because, again, there was no instruction she had learned piano with a set of rules to, that she made up. Um, so as far as technique and like all the rules that you're supposed to learn if you guys have ever taken piano lessons, there's things teachers teach you. Um, and because she didn't have a teacher, really, uh, she had learned piano with o- her own set of rules. And so I just got to sit down with her and, and I would be like, okay, Danielle, this is proper posture. And let me tell you why this is good posture and what it helps is I don't want you to end up with carpal tunnel. I don't want you to hurt your, hurt your hands long term. Like there's a reason why these things exist. And so I would just sit down with her sitting on that piano bench together, and it was, it was 30 minutes of basically this. It was me saying, like this, not like this, Daniela. And then we'd continue, like this, not like this. And here's what Jude's getting at in this passage. He's going to give us three, three moments, three specific ways where he's saying very, very clearly, and he's teaching us still today, not like this. Three not like this, that you're going to find in these three verses here in Jude. I'm going to start in verse 8, and we're going to move to verse 10. That's what I'm calling the message for tonight. Not like this. Not like this. And we want to receive that word from God. What is it that God's trying to speak to us here tonight? But first, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time that we get to spend together. Thank you that you are here, and you are moving. Um, You are not reluctant to meet with us. You say that if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. And so as we've drawn near to you, we already sense you here. And we um, now open up our hearts and we say, do what you want to do, God. Um, Whatever it is uh, that I was planning on preaching, Lord, would you just uh, put it on my heart if there's something I need to say or if there's something I don't need, I shouldn't say. I pray that you just erase it from my mind and I submit fully to whatever you want to accomplish tonight. And we do that together as your people As your children, have your way here tonight, God. Thank you for meeting us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Jude, verses 8 through 10. Um, It's on the screen. It says this. In the very same way, so if you go back to last week's message and you remember what we were talking about, so all the judgments that come from God, the warnings that are in the Scripture, and then he says, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams... These ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. 
verse 9 says. But, the, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him, that's talking about the devil, for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Um, again, some pretty heavy warnings in this passage, but I think there's something really, really important for us to see. Th- and, and it all surrounds this idea of not like this. This is not the life that we're supposed to live. Again, remember, Jude's talking about these people who are in the church. They had infiltrated the church, and they are presenting uh, teaching that is not uh, in line with what the gospel is that was taught by the apostles to the church. And so that's why he's telling us, you have to contend for the faith. We've talked about this. It's about defending the faith. One of the things that's so interesting about the book of Jude is there's no, um, we don't really know what they were teaching. So, you know, there's speculation about like they were teaching this or that, but at the end of the day, we just don't know. And I think that's, that's really intentional because now we can, you know, fast forward 2,000 years and the reality is, is the false versions of the gospel will continue to be spun out. And there's always going to be new false versions. But here's the thing, what we're contending for is the same thing it's always been. And so it doesn't matter really what the, what the attack on the gospel is. We're supposed to defend what we know to be true, what we've been taught in the scriptures. So these people are in the church and that's why we're contending for the faith. We are standing strong. We will defend what has been handed to us through the scriptures And these verses in Jude identify three characteristics of these people. And you saw it there in verse 8. The three things are, one, they pollute their own bodies. Two, they reject authority. And three, they heap abuse on celestial beings, which we'll get to that in a bit. (laughs) I'll explain what what that's really getting at here in just a few minutes. But here's what we're going to do tonight. I want to spend a little bit of time on the setup of the verse, which says that it Everything that they do, those three things, is based off the strength of their own dreams. That's what the NIV uses. And that's where it comes from. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that phrase. And then I'm just going to walk you three, th- through those three things, those three not-like-that moments with Jude. And uh, that's where we're going to spend our time here tonight. But first, I want to point to where these people are claiming to find permission to act the way they are. So he's saying they do those three things that they shouldn't be doing But this is where they're claiming to get it from. And it's from that phrase, they're pulling it from the strength of their dreams. And uh, it's it's a little hard for us to to read that and be like, what are they doing? You you have to understand, the strength of their dreams in the the original language is connected to the three points I'm, I'm talking about tonight. So from the strength of their dreams, they're polluting their own bodies. From the strength of their dreams, they're rejecting authority. From the strength of their dreams, they're doing whatever to the celestial beings. We'll get to that in a bit. So all those three things are connected to from the strength of their dreams. Here's what that means. They are claiming special revelation. They're claiming that someone outside of themselves through dreams, a divine entity, and I think most likely, I believe they're claiming that God gives them permission to act the way they do. So with words, they're saying through dreams, God has said this, and so therefore we can act this way. And that's what Jude is saying. He's like, yeah, but that's not okay at all because that is not what God says. God says the exact opposite of what you're doing is what you should be doing. So you cannot attribute this to God. And this is why this idea of listening and hearing God is so important for us to understand what are what are we saying when we say that God is still speaking? And what are what are the things we can we can have to to understand when when God speaks to us? Is it the same as God writing, you know, books of the Bible, inspiring books of the Bible? Or is it something different that we need to use nuance and we need to use wisdom to discern? Because that's what they're doing. They're straight up just claiming that they have some sort of special revelation. They're the ones saying, I know the apostles said this, but now through our dreams, we can tell you this. You can now live this way. And, And that might not be what you hear today specifically, but I think we do hear today a lot more of, you might have heard that God said thousands of years ago in some book, some things, but I'm telling you in 2023, like that just doesn't apply. And that is an appeal to saying the rules have changed when God has not said anything different and he will not deny himself. And I absolutely believe that God is still speaking and he still guides us, but we have to, we have to look at what he's doing and we have to 
um, we have to test it. We have to spend time with him to make sure he's saying it and it's not coming from somewhere else. And that's what we're invited into in the scriptures. God is not going to go against what he said already. So just three thoughts on hearing God real quick, and then we'll get to these three uh, not like that things that uh, Jude is teaching us. So three thoughts on hearing God. Here's the first one as you, dis- as you discern, is this God? Is God speaking to me in this way? I would first say this to you. One, it can't be new revelation. It can't be new revelation. Here, and I put it in quotes because I have to explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that is this. <laughs> It can't be a new book of the Bible that you're coming up with. And uh, this is, John speaks of that in the book of Revelation, ver- uh, chapter 22. This is just the last few verses of the entire Bible. The Apostle John says this. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, that's him talking about what he just wrote, if anyone adds to anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. The point being... This is a very, very serious thing to claim that you have a revelation from God, something from God to us, what happened in the scriptures. That is such a serious matter because this is how we're finding the truth of Jesus is because of what's been handed down to us through the generations in the church. So God takes this very, very seriously. We can't just say, okay, I've received special revelation, new revelation in that way. And I know many of you would never claim that, but what I'm saying is here we are in the, in the country that we live in, there are many versions of that today. And there are people who, they won't say the Bible's wrong, they'll simply say it's incomplete. And then there's this some experience with some person at some place at some time, and then God said this, and basically what it comes down to is then they're saying the rules have changed. And God said so. And that is why Peter talks about how we have found a more sure word of prophecy. You have to know that what you're holding in your hand is so important. This is what, where we find all the things pertaining to life and godliness. Like This is the rule book for us. It is what helps us make our way through life because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we cannot listen and say, okay, I think I heard something, but it's not going to be new revelation. It's not going to go against anything that God has already revealed through the scriptures. So that's the first question I bring to you is, you know, do you, do you hear something that would cons- be considered new revelation? That's what it can't be, but really, here's what it can be. And this is where it gets so awesome to see how the Lord is still speaking today. It can be a fresh specificity. It can be a fresh specificity. I use the word fresh because what makes something fresh? It doesn't necessarily mean it's new. Something is fresh because it, it feels new. <laughs> it feels new for me right now. That's what makes something fresh. It's like, I know the ingredients, but these ingredients got put together at such a specific point in time in my life, and then they got spoken over me, and that is what God does all the time. <laughs> I've, had, I've had things spoken to me where people come, and they're like, man, I just feel like impressing my heart. I need to speak this to you, and it is a fresh specificity, nothing against what God has already revealed. It's simply God bringing a a spotlight to something he wants me to hear extra loud right now. And one of the awesome things that happens, that's, that's the gift of prophecy. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when he says this, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. And I would argue that all three of those things, strengthening, encouragement, and comfort, they imply a specificity. Because comfort, when I receive comfort, it's to something specific. It's not just a general comfort. It's going to be to something specific. Same way I'm, through the encouragement. That means to add strength to someone so that they can continue. So it's really specific to what's happening in your life. And so what it is when we hear God, God speaks through people. He speaks through people that are inside the church who have this gift. And they're going to be able to push you in the direction of strength, being encouraged, and being comfort, and that is something God does, okay? So that's not new revelation, but that is God bringing a fresh specificity, and I absolutely believe that. I've lived that. I think that happens during sermons all the time. Have you ever experienced that, where like a sermon's going on, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was not for anyone else. That was me today, like for this one time, and this is what's awesome, is God does that all the time in different ways, and that's because he's still speaking. He's just not ever going to deny himself. Third thing about hearing God It can be a fresh specificity, and then also it can be a guiding voice to direct us. That is something God does. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says it this way, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
in order to walk the path that God wants us to walk, it involves walking by the Spirit, with the Spirit, in the Spirit. It's kind of like, take your, you know, preposition of choice. It's describing something that's pretty hard to describe, which is how exactly it plays out that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and how we partner with the Holy Spirit. Um, I cannot tell you guys the scientific method of how that happens. So if I, I, all I can do is I can describe it to you, what it looks like to walk by the Spirit, in the Spirit. I can tell you that when I look back in my life, and as I've had my own set of struggles with sin and patterns of sin and feeling like, man, is this ever going to change? And feeling that hopelessness, but then realizing, well, let's see what God says about these things. And what is the path forward? What is repentance? What is confession? Walking through all those things, and I've experienced victory over sin. There are things in my life that used to be there that are no longer there. And that's not because I'm awesome. That's because God's awesome. So it does happen. But when I look back, I remember how it happened. It happened by me choosing to read choosing to believe, choosing to say yes to God and, and bringing my choices and saying, okay, God, will you say this? So I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to take a step forward. But then also when I look back, I'm like, yeah, but I didn't really do that. Like I couldn't have done that on my own. It's not really an Eddie thing. So it's not, I just decided and then it happened. It's so clear to me that when I look back, it's like, no, that's only God can do that. Like I can't just will myself into a better place in regards to sin. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so where, do, where did my choices end and where did God's power start? I, I can't tell you. <laughs> I can't tell you, but this is what I can tell you is if you choose to seek that and submit to it and ask God for it, for, for his Holy Spirit to, to lead you, to guide you, you will experience what that is. See, so many times we get to a fork in the road in life and suddenly it's like, God, we haven't talked to you for six months, but now we're like, I need, I need to know, like left or right. And that's what's so hard about people who are seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's like, well, maybe we should spend some time getting to know what that looks like in our lives. And then actually what happens is this. If you give the time and you submit yourself to the work of the Spirit, you invite it into your life, you spend the time in Scripture, spend the time in prayer, you get to that fork of the road in life. And as long as it doesn't have to do with sin, it really just turns into like, and then I just want to go left instead of right. And it's awesome. And that's great. Um, and there's the guidance of the Holy Spirit through that is, we acknowledge him in all our ways and he directs our path. So that's the combination is what we're doing. We're, we're going to invite God in. We're going to partner with him and he will always direct the path. And it, it's not always like, a, oh, I heard a voice from heaven or I had this dream and I now know. It's not always like that. Many, many times it's I am walking with the spirit, by the spirit, in the spirit. And as long as that's happening, I'm not really worried about if it's left or right in life. And that's what it shows up like for us. So when we have moments where we're trying to discern things like, you know, maybe one of you say, I think God wants me to move to England to start a church. It's like, great, okay. So you, you have something on your heart. Now let's go through that list. Is that new revelation? Nope, there's nothing at all in that idea that would ever go against anything God has ever spoken. Actually, it lines up with the mission that we've all been given, which is the Great Commission. And so it's like, okay, great. So it checks off that. Then I wonder, you know, can it be a fresh specificity? Absolutely. That's where we're in the territory. It's like, it's, that's not for everyone. That's something that God needs to speak to specific people who are going to have that calling on their lives. And it's going to be different from everyone else's. And I use this one because it's easy to understand. But hear me when I say, there are things, specific things that God wants you to step into. He wants no one else to step into. And it doesn't matter if you want to be in ministry or not. It doesn't matter where he's placed you, what family, what job, what school, wherever God has you, there is a calling that he has placed on you that he's not going to give to anyone else. And that's why we have to listen. There is a specific calling that God has for you, and, it's, and that's why we walk in the Spirit, and we seek to walk in the Spirit so that we can walk in the ways that he specifically has for us. Point being this, not everyone who says they've heard from God is hearing from God. Just because someone says they're hearing from God, just like these people, they're saying they, they had these dreams, just because they're saying it doesn't mean it's true. So that's why we have to test what they say. That's the first thing. But I found the second thing to be really helpful for me, at least. You test what they say, but also observe their lives. Like, ob observe, if a person comes to you and they're like, I have something to say to you, it's like, great, okay, I will test it, I will receive it, I will pray over it, always receive it, right? Because what if it is from God? What if, if it is a prophetic word? I always want to be open-handed with this, so I will receive it, I will pray over it. But then I also do observe the person's life because I think there is 
there is a group of people out there who are really kind of um, focused on the wow factor of these moments when God can speak something specific to me. And I don't really care about the wow moment. I care about that God said it. Um, and so that's why I like lo- observing people's lives because you can pretty quickly discern if like, oh, that person is also submitted to the Lord. They're living a life following after Jesus. And if you see a lot of that, that all helps you um, be able to receive that word from the Lord. And you're also inviting godly counsel in the whole process. So just those few thoughts on hearing God, because I see it in the passage that these people are claiming to have these dreams. I thought it's so important that we never get to the place where we think simply because we have an impression on our heart, that gives us permission to do whatever we want. That is such dangerous territory, and we should not be those people. The people of God have never been those people. That's not the history of the church. We're the people who open ourselves to the leading of the Spirit, but then we're using wisdom every step of the way, the way the church has for thousands of years. All right, so back to verse 8. Let me read that verse again. He says, based off the strength of their dreams, they do these three things. They pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. Here's the first thing that Jude's saying, not like this. He's saying, don't pollute your own bodies. Now, that phrase is a specific reference to sexual sin. Okay, pollute your own bodies is a different way of saying don't participate in sexual immorality. And so this is where uh, our first um, not like this, do this, not like this that we have here in this passage is that we're supposed to choose God's design for sexuality versus satisfying all sexual desires. That's what's at odds here, either God's design for sexuality or satisfying all sexual desires. Now, I don't feel the need to spend a ton of time on this point. Why? Because literally the past two times I've preached, it's, it's, I had to talk about sexual sin. It's like, oh my gosh, Eddie always talks about sexual sin. That's <laughs> what it's feeling like to me. So I don't feel the need to camp on this. If you haven't heard me preach on this, just go to the last two messages. My gosh, we have spent so much time on this. But I, I will be, I want to honor God's word every single time. So I'm not going to skip it either, okay? So this is what God's saying is you cannot claim to just because you have a desire that that gives you permission to enter into satisfying that desire. That is not how we live. Somehow we think that the stronger desire, the stronger the desire is, the more real it is, the more true it is, the more good it is. That is not true. You can really, 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 really want to do something that's really, really, really bad for you. Okay, so just because we feel strongly about it doesn't mean we should be satisfying. And there is There is nothing inside of God's design that is dirty. It is all beautiful. It's to be enjoyed inside of his boundaries. But now, because of our sinful nature, we're going to struggle with that. We're going to struggle with it because we are going to want things that are outside of God's design. But what what Jude is pointing out is just because you want it doesn't mean you should. I mean, if we live that way, think about living that in all areas of your life. Just because you want it means you should. That will blow up your life pretty fast. It wouldn't take a long time to get to just complete destruction in our lives if we lived with that MO. So those sexual desires are there, and that's that's the problem. The problem is when we let our sexual desires trump God's design. If they stay at desires, that is not the problem. The problem is when we say, because I have this desire, I will see tonight. The phrase Jude uses is so intentional and so helpful, helpful for us. He says that you pollute your own body. What he's bringing attention to is that sexual sin, it hurts you. It hurts your heart. It hurts your body. And we have to reject this idea that like God, God's withholding the awesome parts of sexuality from us. That is not true at all. God has made for sexuality to be the most awesome, beautiful thing within his creation, but we have to, re- we have to receive and respect his boundaries because his design for it is what we're seeking after. And so that's why Jude's saying, look, not, not like that. Just because you want it, not like that. Do not listen to that. And he actually gets pretty aggressive. I don't know if you caught it in verse 10, the first time I read it. At the end of verse 10, he says, basically, um, like even the animals understand that if you feel it and then you just want it, that's, that's a pretty low bar. Like, that's a pretty low bar. So animals are hungry, then they eat, they kill and eat. And then animals, if they have a sexual desire to procreate, then they just go and try to satisfy that desire. That's a really low bar for humans. And that's what they're behaving like. Just because I feel this, therefore I must satisfy it, then we are called to something so much greater than that. And that's what he's getting after. And so the good news is, even though it hurts us, Sexual sin hurts us, it, it hurts our hearts, it hurts our bodies. Um, listen, 
even if we step into that, God still has the redeeming power of Jesus available for us. Okay, so even though you've been polluted, if you've participated in any of those things, like many, many of us have, when we participate in that, yes, we receive the damage of it, but listen, that doesn't mean you have to stay there forever. God, God is in the business of resurrection. This is what he does. He takes things that are dying, and he says, I will breathe life into it. And he redeems, and he restores, and that's how awesome he is. That no matter what our choices are, his power is still great enough to redeem and to restore and so the pollution happens, but it's not permanent if you believe in the saving work of Jesus. And that's why it's such good news. So that's the first thing we see Jude teaching us. Second thing, we see him present the idea of the authority of God versus anarchy. The authority of God versus anarchy. I know when we use the word anarchy, we're normally talking about like if, if the government just like blew up and everyone's just like running in the streets without any sort of you know, order and everyone has their own guns and like all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, that's... That's really like a great picture of what he's talking about here spiritually when he says they reject authority. They reject authority. Now, there's some debate about whose authority is being rejected here in this verse. Um, there's some talk about like maybe it is earthly rulers. Maybe he's talking about they reject the, the earthly rulers, which would be, you know, in our day, like government, presidents, senators, like whoever's above us and, and any sort of authority. Or maybe they're talking about angels because angels are messengers from God, so they have some sort of authority. Um, or the third option is that it's, it's God's authority directly. And I would suggest to you that the, the best understanding of the verse is that it's God's authority. And the reason for that is because he uses authority as a singular word, not a plural word. It would have made most sense if he was trying to talk about earthly rulers or angels, that it would have been they reject authorities, plural. Um, but because he says it in the singular, I think he's implying and saying it's, it's they reject God's authority. So God is the authority, and that's really your two choices. Either God is or isn't. There's, there's not really anything in between. Okay, he either is the authority he claims to be. Um, in that God spot of, the, of your heart, there's only room for either he is or he isn't. Um, and so when it comes to the role of God, we have to accept that. We have to receive it because the, the other alternative is an anarchy in our hearts. That's what happens. There's, there's, no, there's no boundaries, which... Life without boundaries is a different definition for sin. That's what it is. It's, it's rejecting all the boundaries that God has given us. And it's so important, especially in a church context, that you guys understand that the pastors, any pastor who gets up to teach, we're not the ultimate authority. Like, I am not at the top of that authority. I, with you, stand under this authority. So God has revealed what he says and then I, with you, I, I stand under the authority of the scriptures. This is another way that things get really sideways really fast. When you can go to a place, and, the, and it might even be someone preaching a Bible like the one I'm holding in my hands, but then over time you're like, yeah, but it feels like whatever the leader says is like law. Like it's all about what the pastor or whatever word is used for the leader and that's when things get really, really out of hand because we were never made to stand under the ultimate authority of a human. We were made to stand under the ultimate authority of God, the God of the universe, the one true God. That's what you were made to be under. And so just be really, really careful anytime you're hearing someone, even if they claim to be preaching the Bible, claim to speak on behalf of God, be very careful and, and see that, watch, observe them too. Are they acting like they get to be the authority of your life? Or are they doing what every pastor should do, which is, look, I want to tell you guys about the authority of God. That's my heart. I want you to know what God says. I want you to see it, and I want you to experience it. That's why we give so much time to teach the Word of God is because I want you to experience it for yourself. And I just know, anytime we talk about this idea of authority, there are some of you in the room, this is like a non-issue, this is not difficult for you, but I also know that there are some of you in this room that this idea is very difficult for you. Because if you were to rewind back and look back at, at the years you've lived, and you see that every time you've been under an authority structure, so whether that be a family system, if you, you had parents and you were like, man, yeah, that didn't go great. And every time you felt that your parents had to exercise authority over you, you couldn't handle it. And then you go into, your, you know, into school and seeing the, the authority structures that are inside of your school or your education system, and you, and you kind of buck up against that, and it's always been a negative thing for you to be under authority. Well, you will find out in life pretty quick that that is not for your flourishing. We all have to live under authority in many different ways. We live under the authority of a government. We live under the authority of a city. Like all these things are, are for our flourishing. They're not evil things by definition. 
And so if that's you, I, I wanted to bring this up because maybe that's one of the things that you're struggling with in regards to God. Maybe the, the thing that you kind of want to be in, but you're struggling to fully go there is because you know that you have to submit and you have to release full control of that in your life. And that is part of what it means to be a child of God is you, you don't get to be a peer with God ever. You will never approach God as just like, hey, you're just, hey, can, can we just agree on some things? No, no, no. <laughs> if you're going to believe in God, this is, we have to all get to the point where it's like, not my authority, it's God's. Not anarchy, where I'm just doing whatever comes my way, I will submit to the authority of God. And maybe today's that day of surrender for some of you, where you could just say, you know what, I'm done pushing against that, and I'm ready to just surrender to that in my life. That's the second thing. And then finally this, this is where he talks about the celestial beings. I'll get to why this point makes sense here in a second, but I think he's making the point that we have to lean towards trust in God, real trust in God, versus thinking we understand everything thinking we're the ones who understand everything. Let me go back to the passage, verse 8. He lists the things, um, and he says there, let's go back to the passage. Um, the dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. Heap abuse on celestial beings. Then, now let's read that with verse 9 where he says, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn the devil for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So these people, what are they doing? They are abusing the celestial beings. I think that's referring to the angels. In, what, what it's saying is they are assuming a position of authority over the angels and, and speaking towards those angels as if they have full authority. It's, they're posturing themselves as if they understand everything. And that's why Jude gives us an example. He's saying even Michael, who is an archangel, when he's in this, you know, argument with the devil, he doesn't even exercise judgment on the devil. Why? Because he understands that belongs to God. As an archangel, anybody, any archangels in the room? You know? No? Okay. Thank you for that honesty. So none of us are archangels. And yet, if, if we act like these people, what we're doing is we're acting as if we know more than the archangels. That we think we can exercise full judgment as if that's something that's supposed to belong to God. He says, the Lord rebuke you. That should be something God does, not something we do. And so what they're claiming is that they know more than these angelic beings. And what that is, is arrogance. And it's claiming to know everything. This is actually why I have a whiteboard here today. I wanted to explain it this way. What if, if we were to say... All the knowledge of the universe, if we're going to represent that as a circle, I want you to think about that. Anything that can be known in the universe is this circle, okay? Now pause and just think about that for a second. Everything that can be known in the universe is inside this circle. Now ask yourself, how much of this circle do I know? Okay, so this is all knowledge possible in the universe. How much of that do we know individually? So I, I, would, I would argue that I'm going to be a little generous to myself here by putting a dot inside that circle. <laughs> so that's what Eddie knows. And that, that's, that's um, I, had, I had to magnify that so that we could see it, you know. <laughs> um, so if that's true, and if anybody here is like, oh, no, I got this big old chunk. I'm like, man, we got a lot of work to do with you. It's like, I, I, hopefully we can all start at understanding. If this is everything that can possibly be known, I know only this, and what Jude's saying is, if it's true that we know only this, then why do we act like we know so much more? Like, why do we go around life thinking, oh, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm this. Like, I, I know so many things. Like, you're, you're, you're the dumb one, and because you're dumb because you disagree with me, and I'm the one who knows all this stuff. And we go through life thinking that's the end game, which is ultimately just knowledge. Knowledge is the end game. That is an idol of, an a, of the age that we live in, and that is not the calling God has on us. It's not, you, you don't need to know all the answers, okay? You'll never know all the answers. That, that circle doesn't fit in any of our brains. We weren't built to have that, all that capacity to know that. So instead, what the Lord gives us is he gives us an ability, an invitation. He reveals himself to us so that what we can do is we can just take a step towards him. And then we can take another step towards him and take another step towards him. He reveals enough so that what we do is we end up getting closer to God 
through the knowledge that he reveals to us. Knowledge isn't the end game. And, and I'm concerned of a generation thinking we only will believe if we can understand it. We will, we will only believe and receive and accept God and submit to his authority if we can see that full circle. But here's the problem is that circle is way too big and you were never meant to know what the, what's in there. You weren't made that way. And here's the awesome part about it is I don't need to have all the answers. I don't need to understand everything about the universe because as I've started walking in the spirit, spend time in the scriptures in prayer, I gain a trust in the answer, but the answer is not a sentence. The answer is a person. The answer is a person. And so there will be things in life. I, I wish I could promise you, oh, I can just, I can answer anything you go through in life. I don't, I don't, I can't. I would never pretend that that's what I can do. But I can, sh I can show you how I've found the answer in a person. And that's where I get to the point where I can say, I trust God. And that's what it means to trust. It's, it's I don't know the full circle, but I know the one who does. And that's enough. And that's enough. On this dark day where I wish I could understand more, I, I may or may not understand more in the future, but here's what I'm holding on to. I know the one who does. I know the one who sees it all outside of time. Like God doesn't even need, God steps into time so that I can even perceive him <laughs> because that's how awesome he is. Like he, he gets it all. He is infinite in every single way that our minds can't fathom it. That's why the psalmist, I mean, people in scripture all the time use words like, you know, we can know God, but also his ways are unsearchable. It's like you can find God, yes, because he's made himself findable, but there's always more of God to be had. There's never a day you'll live and be like, I got it. I got enough God in my life. No, there's always more. It's infinite. And you know, back in 2019, I was going through a pretty rough time in my life. And uh, this was before moving to Colorado. And so I, I went to a, a counselor, a therapist, and um, in this, you know, I've done that a few times during the course of my life. But I really enjoyed this chapter of counseling because I, uh, my counselor started sharing something with me about just understanding how to express trust in God. And I would come to our sessions and I would be like, oh my gosh, like I am feeling the weight of this. Like I see this and I'm pretty upset about it. Like this thing I just witnessed should never have happened. This thing I had to behold with my eyes grieves my heart and I know God's not okay with it. And, and I just, it should never happen. Why does it exist? And then my counselor had to, had to walk me through this principle and say, okay, so what can you do about it? What is it that God has placed in your hands to do something about it? And sometimes we'd be like, okay, I think I'm supposed to do this or I'm supposed to do that. But most of the times I needed to say it. I needed to express my frustration, my own anger about this. And then I needed to get to the place where I could pray this simple prayer. And this is what I'm commending to you here tonight. You got to get to the place where you can say, God, I leave this in your hands. I leave this in your hands. Is, and this, um, even without the counselor that I had, I still pray that I just do this with God. When I have to behold something that grieves my heart, when I'm just so mad about something that happened and that I had to see, and just there's so much evil, like we, we see it all around us. And when I see things like that, I have to pray that. Like I have to pray, God, this is really messed up that this happened. It's really wrong that this person did this but I'm not God. I'm not the archangel. And even if I was, Michael still says, but the Lord's going to take care of that. I'm not going to take care of that. So yes, you, you experience all those things. And that's why when you look into the Psalms, there are many times David will be like expressing that anger, but he's expressing it to God in worship. It's a worshipful moment for him to express that. And he's not going to enact the judgments of God. He's handing it to God for him to be the one trusted with the judgments. I can tell you this. Only the person who has full knowledge of everything in the universe should be the one enacting judgment. And when we get to the end of the ages, what the book of Revelation tells us is that all God's judgments were righteous and true. When we all get to the end and we look back at everything God decided, we're never going to doubt that he decided anything wrong. We're going to look back and say everything he said, everything he did was righteous. It was good. It was right that he did it. 
and it was true. There was no falsehood in anything that he did. So that's why I'm saying to you, if there's anything bearing down on your shoulders here tonight, like maybe just get to that place and say, God, I don't think God's asking me to do anything about it, but he is asking you to pray that, God, I leave it. I let go of it right now and I leave it in your hands. So here's what we're gonna do tonight to close. Why don't you go ahead and stand? I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna sing a song together. And as we sing, my invitation to you is if there is something that God is maybe speaking to you where he's saying to you right now, if you can hear his voice, he's saying, not like that, not like that. And if he's saying that to you, tonight's the night where you can come into agreement with God. And what I'm going to ask you to do as, uh, after I pray and as we're singing the song, we're going to open up the front of the room, the sides of the room, and I would invite you, if you want to say yes to the Lord, I'm not going to specify anything for you. I'm going to leave that between you and God. But I want you to put a physical representation of saying yes to God. So the invitation is in the spaces, front, on the sides, just get out of your seat during that song and kneel down because kneeling is a, such a great way of knowing I will let go. I'm going to put myself low so that God is the one high and exalted. And so on the things we talked about tonight, if there's anything, any sexual sin, any desire that you've been wrestling with and you've given validity to it because you feel it so strong, maybe tonight's to say, God, I'm not like that anymore. I'm letting go of that tonight. I'm going to leave it right here. I'm going to kneel. I'm going to pray that. I'm going to release it into your hands. Or maybe you are the one who's been struggling being under the authority of God and you've been wrestling that out with him. Maybe you can get on your knees and just say, that is it. I receive the fact and I believe that God is the authority. I will stop rejecting it and I will submit to it and I will spend the rest of my days learning what it means to be under the authority of God. Or maybe that's you who, who feels the weight and you've kind of been acting like you know more about the universe than you know and, and this is your night to say, I'll, I'll trust you, God. God, I leave this thing in your hands and no one else's. So let me pray for you. And then you can come forward, come to the sides as we sing, and let's worship together. But let me pray first. Father, Father, before we, before we even move on, thank you that we find our rest in you. So we quiet our hearts right now. We're, we're in no rush. We want to be able to hear and to listen what, to what it is that you're doing. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would bring that specificity to everyone in the room. Say it. Say it louder in our hearts right now. And God, we say this is your house because it's a house of prayer. And so we will spend these next few minutes praying because this is your house and we want to spend time with you. And what's so amazing, so amazing is that you want to spend time with us. May you delight in the surrender. May you delight in what we let go of here tonight. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You can come to the front, to the sides as we sing. Come whenever you're ready. Thank you. 
Let's not rush out of this moment. Keep pressing in, guys. Look, there's, there's, more, there's more for us here. I think some of us in the room might be, um, you're wrestling a little bit, I think, with the stigma that, like, the need for repentance is somehow a shameful thing. But in the kingdom of God, when Jesus is on the throne and we come under him, repentance is like, it's just like the, the natural flow of your life. Um, like, it's, it's like the life with Jesus is a life where we walk and we take a step and we're like, God, you have all of me and my everything. And then, like, the next day we sort of forget and we kind of drift. And then the Lord in his mercy, like, he's like, hey, like, come on. And then you're like, oh, God, you're right. Forgive me. And you kind of step back. And it's like the, the journey of the Christian life is a continual journey of, like, the Lord in his mercy course correcting us. And so there's no stigma around the need for repentance like zero. Like if you're if you're here and like you feel the Lord speaking to you and you're like, "Oh, like wow, yeah. Like I, I was doing that." Praise God. Like you are in good company. Right? Welcome to the club. We are all in this space. Y'all, I'm sitting there and Jesus is like pulling on my heart about ways that I've uh, I've like presumed that I have had more knowledge. And he's like, like, "Josh, you just need to like trust me with this one. You don't have what you need." Like you, or you don't have it this all together. It's like, praise God. Praise God that we don't have to have all the answers and we can just come back together. So if you're in any of these categories, I just, I want to give us one more opportunity uh, to, to really press into repentance here. Because it is, it's, it's the life of faith and it's joyful. And it's joyful. So let's just take even another 20 seconds, even just in silence, Jesus, is there anything that you are inviting us to repent for? Of course, correct.
Christian walk is that once the Lord in his mercy does reveal things to us, we repent, we seek to change the way that we think and the way that we live, we throw ourselves on the mercy of God again and say, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. But then the beauty of the Christian walk is that we actually get to listen as God tells us that he loves us and that he forgives us. So here's, here's how I want to end tonight, right? We've, we've gone to our knees as an act of submission and surrender and trust. Why don't we stand to our feet together tonight? As an act of stepping out of tonight in the grace and the freedom of Jesus. Because whatever you came to Jesus with, it's It's gone. The grace of the, of the cross is that when we bring our burdens to him, he carries them. Like you, you will never be more clean than you are right now, covered in the blood of Jesus. Like this is the truth. We grow in knowledge and in sanctification of Jesus, but there's not a moment where you're going to be more covered in the blood of grace. And so what I want us to do is to leave in that tonight. Leave in joy. Leave in hope tonight. So if you want to just hold your hands out, what I want us to do, we're just going to receive that as a gift. God, I ask that you would give us the joy of our salvation again. Restore to us again the joy of your salvation and pour out your spirit upon us again in a new way. I pray for the easy yoke of Jesus. I pray for the light burden of Jesus. I pray for the hope that comes with the gospel of Jesus and the full knowledge of salvation, knowing that you, you have been purchased with the blood of Jesus, that he loves you and sees you and he's filling you as you're in him and that he's gonna walk with you out of this building. Praise God. So Lord, Let's just, uh, I ask that you just lift every, every burden, lift it all up, and let us go out of here with joy. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say, Jesus? We're, we're ready. We're open. Hmm. Yeah, and thank you, Jesus, that with joy, there's also a sense of peace. I think some of you guys have been feeling some anxiety, right, the tension of these things. The Lord wants to give you peace. So I just pray peace and wholeness and the blood of Jesus over you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and all of young adults said, amen. 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 <laughs> yes. Hey, as always, you guys, it is such a joy to worship with you guys. These Tuesday nights are so rich and fun and full. Thank you for coming and joining us. Um, don't rush out, y'all. Some of the best connection happens in, like, the next hour. So, like, stick around, linger. No one's going to chase you out. Um, real quick, before we go, can I have my young adult mentors just raise their hand? Yes. Okay. I know we've been talking about these a little bit. These guys are worth a round of applause. Hey, if they're in this room and they're raising their hand, it means that they're here for you. They want to connect with you. Sometimes after a moment or a night like this, it is just like so helpful to come to someone and even just have them pray with you or listen to you or just like kind of seal that moment. They would love to do that with you. Um, so go and find them. Last little thing, we have a welcome table. If you're looking at this like, what's that? Oh, sorry. I thought she was telling me something I was announcing wrong. We're good. My bad. Victoria corrects me. Sorry. Um, okay, if you're looking there, you see the, the curtains. Right on the other side, we have a welcome table. There are people who would love to talk to you more about young adults. If you are new, come and talk to us. We have a little gift for you. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to come find out for yourself. So um, bless you guys. We love you, and we'll see you next week.